Hi, I'm Nicole Kelly and I'm the author of Lament, published by Hawkeye Publishing. You can find Lament under the historical fiction genre on the Australian Book Lovers website. Lament is my debut novel and is a reimagining of Ned Kelly's life. It's the story of what might have happened if the gang had not been captured at Glen Rowan on that fateful night, if the teacher Thomas Kerno hadn't flagged down the train. It's the life that Ned might have had. Lament has been called clever, wicked, provoking and satisfying and I'm really pleased to be able to share Lament and my Ned Kelly with you. Once upon a time, welcome to Australian Book Lovers, your destination for imagination. Big warm welcome to everyone and a huge thank you for joining us for the Australian Book Lovers podcast. Our mission is to bring fabulous Australian and Indigenous literature that spans a whole range of genres to book lovers around the globe, as well as fantastic resources and information for passionate authors looking to write their next bestseller. I'm Veronica Strachan, aka V.E. Patton, fantasy, memoir and picture book writer, reader and one of your co-founders and hosts for today's podcast, coming to you from a very chilly Wurundjeri country in Victoria. And I am Darren Kazanko, dystopian science fiction and horror author, reader, and one of your hosts and co-founder of the Australian Book Lovers podcast, coming to you today from corner country. And uh, I hate to rub it in, but it's quite warm and sunny here down in oh, the uh, wonderful <laughs> Fluro Peninsula of South Australia. Not fair. I think we were... Be lucky to get to 12 degrees here in the uh, the Macedon Ranges. So, yeah, not oh, wow. so warm. I think just my socks are hotter than that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I tell you something 31. that is, it is episode 31. And not only oh, that, it's a but 32. We, oh, it's a 32. Yeah. Oh, not yeah. only that, but we have hit 2,000 downloads. So thank you to Holy everybody. Moly. Yeah, everybody who has... Uh, followed us, who has listened to the fabulous interviews with Australian authors. And not only that, but the last two episodes that we did, the amazingly generous Australian book lovers authors who gave us a little reading from their books, they are going gangbusters. People are listening to these little 10, 15 minute excerpts and they're just loving it. So that's fantastic. Yeah, can't, I mean, I've said thank you a couple of times now, but I'll say it again. Huge thanks to all the authors for going to the trouble of, of recording, you know, snippets and, and readings from all your wonderful works. Those episodes were bumper huge episodes. And, you know, look, putting it together was, you know, not, not exactly the easiest thing in the world, but the result is just absolutely fantastic. And I think that that's definitely going to become a permanent feature of our podcasting programming because yes. what a what a you know awesome way of listeners to the podcast and obviously book lovers of d discovering you know potentially a new author or a new tale to read uh, it's a great way especially you know if you're commuting or walking or working out whatever you might be doing uh, but dive into the imagination of an author through through your ears and hopefully you're inspired to go you know what I'm going to grab that book that sounds fantastic Yes. And the other thing is that a little bit like if you join a, a book club or something like that, is that you may read a book that you would not normally pick up. And to hear, you know, a chapter read by the author or, you know, introduced by the author is, it's insight into their voice, isn't it? And uh, yeah, that, that is really amazing. Yeah, it's beautiful that's... to have all sorts of different history, fantasy, uh, you know, middle grade, memoir, thrillers. Yeah, there's some really amazing books out there. Yeah, well, look, I, you know, go. Of course, we fly by the seat of our pants on this podcast, but I'm thinking moving really, forward. Really, don't yeah, tell don't anybody just... our secrets. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm thinking moving forward, we could even uh, break break these audio specials into genres, so we can have, you know, for well, example, off the top of my head, a horror special um, with lots of horror stories, and we can have you really? know, historical why was fiction. Horror first, you know, why did that come up? I wonder. Well, <laughs> I think it was underrepresented in the last one, so we've got to really? come out swinging. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it would be super fun. So looking forward to bringing all of our wonderful listeners, uh, you know, future episodes or special edition episodes of author readings. And to all to everyone who's, you know, busted us into the past the year 2000 or the number 2000 um, of downloads, that yes. is just spectacular. It and is. Uh, you can't see my big grin, but it is here. No, it well, is even there. if we're in public, you wouldn't be able to see my grin because <laughs> we're wearing masks now. So. No, well, that's it. That's it. Uh, but also we have got the short stories coming up and we've had some we of our do. authors drop in some short stories, which is great. So we're getting uh, that as another little feature of the website. Yeah, well, so. well, speaking of the website, mm. I guess, uh, well, we are recording on a Sunday morning, so that's why I didn't yes. even know what episode we're doing. But I can, <laughs> now that I'm confidently can say it's episode number 32, how about we jump into some news for episode number 32? Excellent. So why don't you tell us what is on the website? Yeah, it would be my pleasure. So we've got some fantastic new titles on the Australian Book Lovers website and uh, quite a variety too. So without further ado, I thought I would read through some of the titles and the synopsises. And uh, of course, if there's something that perks your interest, please do jump onto the website and take a look because these are some great, great titles. Going to start with one called The Bogans. Now, I love that title already. <laughs> so The Bogans is by author, and I hope I pronounced this correct, Chana Wickramesakara. And that is, you can find it under our contemporary uh, genre page, which of course is our awesome looking dolphin with the uh, sunglasses and sipping a latte. Yes. Uh, but The Bogans reads as follows. Park Court is a fairly typical Melbourne neighborhood, hosting a very diverse multicultural community. Africans, Indians, Chinese, Lebanese, Sri Lankans, Christians, Muslims, straight and gay people, they all live there and not always peacefully. What is lacking, however, is a white family to complete the diversity. But when one finally moves into the court, it is more than what anyone had bargained for. And that is The Bogans, once again, by Chana Wickramasakara found under our contemporary very interesting premise there uh sounds like a bit of tongue-in-cheek could be found in that too judging by the title yes <laughs> most definitely <laughs> well and, and i believe uh china has quite a number of books uh published so we're hoping to get a few more moving forward mm -hmm. uh, so so i guess it's going to be a great read regardless uh but it sounds like it's a story about the you know actually bringing a sense of reality to the spin doctors of the government and that is we all we are all in this together and i, I suspect uh, the bogans might be a really uh, interesting i don't know observation by the sounds of it of yeah. what it is to actually live together and to be together and be in this crazy ride we called life together beautiful and the, so the next title uh, this is also found under a contemporary is called starting over by judith c Gian freeman Mm -hmm. Now, Starting Over is a contemporary novel set in a small coastal town in South Australia. When three feisty young women, Erin, Rebecca and Gabby, arrive in a quiet rural backwater, they bring with them a world of complication and trouble. A heartwarming novel, the story arc follows their growing friendship as they start new lives in Woolshed Bay. Here they encounter quirky locals, drug running gangsters, a religious sect, new challenges at every turn and also life-changing relationships <laughs> overcoming <laughs> danger and prejudice they each find love and happiness with three very different men in unexpected ways and that is starting over by judith C. Gian freeman to be found under our contemporary and there's nothing like a small coastal town that can bring you <laughs> you know quirky locals drug running Whoa, gangsters religious yes. sex i gotta look it up amazing. on the map yeah it sounds like a good sunday afternoon drive see if i can get sucked <laughs> into a cult Okay. That does sound amazing. Now, we've got a new edition under our mystery and thriller as well as historical fiction by our, one of our awesome authors, Christine Gardner, and this book is called Daughter of Darkness. Now, in 1944, during the Second World War, Clara and two other young women work on a farm as part of the Woman's Land Army. Clara enjoys the lifestyle and the hard work, helps her get through each day. No matter how busy she is, though, she can never forget the horror she faced seven years earlier. Her family was a happy one, with Clara and Ruth gradually taking over the running of the tea shop in Lindari, a pretty country town set in beautiful green hills. Their father died when Clara was only four, but she remembers him still. 
When their mother died, they still managed to keep the business running and their life was quiet and pleasant until one night everything changed and Clara was left alone and devastated. And that is Daughter of Darkness by Christine Gardner. Mm. Now, continuing with our mystery and thriller, uh, well, the last one, of course, was also, you can also find in our historical fiction, but we mm. have a title called Will You Keep Me Tomorrow by author Stephen Fine. Mm-hmm. And Will You Keep Me Tomorrow reads as follows. Chester Jones drives his new car to the forested slopes of the Dandenong Ranges in Victoria, Australia, in order to deliver an extravagant gift to a client after cinching a massive business deal. On the side of the road, he discovers something that will change many lives, most particularly that of his and his wife's. In the meantime, a shark-eaten body of a woman is washed up on a beach by the Great Ocean Road, and Detective Bruce Nash is called in to investigate. A few days later, the forensic pathologist breaks news to the detective that will change the course of the investigation. Nash eventually retires to the Dandenong area without having ever solved the case. On a walk one day, Bruce is shocked to see someone that is a carbon copy of the woman that washed up on the beach years before. We Will Keep Me Tomorrow will take the reader on a journey of wealth, romance and murder across the globe. And that is Will You Keep Me Tomorrow by Stephen Fine under our mystery and thrillers. There you go. Now for a bit of a uh, more edgy, maybe mystery thriller, possibly even, well, I guess you could say crime action. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one is titled Sons of Brutality by author Daniel Judy. Mm. So Sons of Brutality reads as follows. Los Angeles is a city under siege. When Detective Addison Mowbray begins investigating the murders of two young women in the Hollywood Hills, he can't imagine where the case will lead. He suspects the crimes were inspired by an, by an occult fascination due to some missing body parts and the inverted Christian cross branded on the victim's breasts. Mm. But apart from Addison's temperamental partner, Jed, the only other person keen on them pursuing that line of investigation is Lily Coniglio, a medical examiner from the coroner's department. The LAPD is already under immense pressure. Due to all the bad press, another killer, a vigilante, has brought to their door. It's been over a year since the first organised crime figure showed up full of holes with a plastic police badge beside his body. As Addison and Jed navigate a murky, disturbing occult landscape in search of answers, they uncover something even more terrifying than a killer hiding in the shadows. An organisation so vile and powerful that it changes their lives forever. Set against a backdrop of urban bleakness and social inequality, Sons of Brutality combines deeply flawed protagonists with human monsters, integrating strong dialogue, violent action and gripping suspense. And that is Sons of Brutality by Daniel Judy, found under our mystery and thrillers. There you go. And to finish things off, I thought I would uh, tell us all about a historical fiction title. Okay. A brand new edition. And this is called The Impossible History of Trotsky's Sister. And that (laughs) That is by... It's a nice rhythm in it. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And that's mm. by author Marie F. Roberts. Uh, not only does the title have a uh, nice uh, rhythm to it, the, the cover, it, although the cover art is very simple, it's very, very cool. Uh, yeah, this, I think the yeah, colours, like colour scheme, the shadows, and the I don't know. There's just, there's definitely a strange emotion that comes from the cover. So I, yeah, I, uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting because I saw that it was one of the features of the week this week on it is the indeed. website. And it's almost because I had I listened to Marie reading her chapter as I went for a walk yesterday, day before, and uh, then I thought about the cover, which is is almost like got like marionettes without the strings. It's yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm. So for for listeners out there, j- jump on to the website and you can see it on the front page, obviously under our features of the week or under historical fiction. Take a look at the cover because I think mm. it's a really great representation of how simplicity can uh, also, I don't know, promise promise so much. So, but yeah, so mm. I don't know. Just I think I like the colour scheme, but uh, mm. yes, there we go. <laughs> I am no art critic, that's for sure. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. Uh, mm. Okay. So The Impossible History of Trotsky's Sister by Marie F. Roberts reads as follows. Olga Kamaneva, feminist and head of the Russian theatre in post-revolutionary Russia, lived through the heady days of that time. As the wife of one of Stalin's inner circle and sister of Leon, Leon Trotsky, 
She was on shaky ground when Stalin targeted both as a political enemies, and she herself was soon consigned by Stalin to the dustbin of history. In the impossible history of Trotsky's sister, she is given another imagined life in post-World War II Australia, as a displaced person amidst the tea and lamingtons of the Melbourne suburbs. The Cold War and the Red Scare mean Olga has to hide her identity and past until history comes knocking on her door. A young woman who is desperate to escape Australian social mores and an explosive revolutionary play press Olga and her ghosts into the struggle again. Olga draws on a revolutionary past and a whole cast of old Bolsheviks, I'm going to say this Bolshevik. correct, be Bolsheviks, <laughs> <laughs> Russian feminists, poets, playwrights and painters to craft her own narrative. This time is history on her side. So that is The Impossible History of Trotsky's Sister by Marie F. Roberts uh, under our historical fiction. And actually, that's quite uh, timely considering uh, the the wonderful guest we've got in today's interview, which yes. is also somewhat of an alternative historical fiction piece. Yeah. Uh, but nonetheless, we'll get to that soon But uh, because it's very exciting, our guest today, none other than Nicole Kelly, uh, which was just superb fun talking to as you all hear. But first, I believe you've got some news for us as well, Veronica. Yes, I do have a little bit of news. And there's something that um, you know, social media, apart from uh, Twitter community, is a bit beyond me. I'm just going to say it. there's so much. It's so all-encompassing and it's just, you know, so many things happening. You could spend your whole day on social media doing really not a lot. So I was interested to read uh, on the, the Books and Publishing uh, website, of, of which we're a member. So please encourage people, if you want to know what's happening in Books and Publishing in Australia and around the world, um, jump on there and get yourself a, a membership there. But there's an article called Book Talk 101, you know, hashtag Book Talk 101. So are you on TikTok? That's a good question, and uh, it's a very simple answer at the moment. Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is, intri it is an intriguing platform. Um, look, yeah. you know, any use of technology that can, uh, you know, you can use as marketing or, you know, to, to uh, I guess, reach out or, or understand viewpoints of different communities, I think is mm -hmm. excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, look, there's, not, there's, there's a devil side. There's a, you know, obviously... Uh, a shadowy side to all social media but yeah. at the same time you know how else you know the question is if we eliminate social media how do we communicate via the internet i mean we go back to the sort of chat rooms don't we in which case that that was no different you never know who you chat chat with there was trolls there was all sorts oh, um, yeah. It's so, nice space that, yeah so they're, they're it's good to have guidelines and, and frameworks and those kind of things but it's also interesting to watch the rise and fall of some of these different platforms and just go wow how easily we are connected so this is an article written by angus dalton and first published by simon and schuster australia and um, books and publishing got permission to uh, redo it so i won't uh, you know mention the whole thing but it's interesting that uh what's happened is that the basics is that it's you know driven by trends yep so the you know tiktok's popularity is skyrocketed apparently there were 1.6 million australian monthly users in lock pre-lockdown now there are 6.8 million monthly users wow so it's another one i missed yeah. out on buying oh yeah and... but no, no, fear not because most of the people logging on apparently millennials and gen z so that's not you and I. Uh, and women between the ages of 12 and 25 are the most enthusiastic users. So uh, how BookTok uh, works is it started accidentally by um, a guy who wrote, let me just, it, it's mostly, um, it seems to work between five and 10 titles that are discussed on BookTok. Mm -hmm. They're usually YA, fantasy and romance but it is kind of expanding into other genres. And apparently a, a guy, an author called Adam Silvera uh, was the unwitting king of book talk. Um, he, some TikTok users picked up his book, uh, which is a queer romance novel. They both die at the end. And they started posting their reactions um, for the last pages, which apparently they both die at the end. So um, then it became a bit of a, trend and of course people bought the book so that they could read it and they could post their uh, responses and he sold something like 300,000 copies and it was just 
I think that was the That's cool. The numbers. <laughs> it was just threw it into the, you know, uh, the top 10 sales and did, you know, all sorts of things. So in the US, apparently the, the, the YA, which is the young adult sales market, uh, sorry, market is up almost 50% in the first half of 2021, thanks to BookTok. So yes, there we go, 300,000 300, copies sold. So in Australia, more than 25,000 copies sold since BookTok discovered that title. So it topped the YA charts six times this year and has held its spot in the top five since March. So that is really, really interesting. It, it because, is just gobsmacking. Yeah, because obviously, you know, from the limited understanding I have of, you know, a service such as TikTok, it, it, it is very short videos. I think 30 seconds, 20 seconds, maybe one minute, I think is probably considered a long one. Mm, mm. Um, but, you know, if you were to just look at that, you would think it would be easy to sort of surmise that the attention span of society is getting shorter and shorter and shorter to the point where, you know, one minute videos is the most, you know, that's, that's the most you're going to get as far as uh, capturing someone's attention. People want 20 yeah. second videos. Yeah. However, that something like hearing a story like that about, you know, a book talk, which is probably based on something, you know, similar principle, short sure, videos, but it just goes to show that same audience will also purchase a book and sit back and, 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 and devote and their it. time yeah. to reading the book. So never the, underestimate uh, the power of the, the you know, the of readers um, really, and, and the smart yeah. minds that are going to be taken over this planet soon. Wow, that, that's exactly right. And I think the thing that interested me about, you know, reading about uh, book talk was that these are videos not posted by uh, publishers or authors. It's by readers. So all the readers out there, if you're interested in in people's reactions to books, have a look at the book talk hashtag and see if anybody else is reading a book that you've got. It's kind of the best way you could possibly do a review. If you read a book that moves you or makes you laugh, you know, cry or think, or it's, you know, as I said, thought provoking, then maybe if you post your review on TikTok, you might find that it really does help your authors out. So yeah, just another little, uh, I guess, thing to add to, to the <laughs> list for authors to uh, think about when they're marketing their books is that, um, yeah, there is also this viral stuff out there that will just go, um, gangbusters. So, yeah. Well, now, now you've got me thinking, Veronica. Um, mm. obvi obviously, uh, we've had some fantastic submissions already for our short stories, which will be get the 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 website is getting built in the background. So, as yep. far as the addition of the short story, so that's coming real soon, finally. And now I'm thinking we can. What do you think we can name the page Short Talk? Because we can do <laughs> <laughs> audio versions of short stories. So, <laughs> no, they'll be a bit longer than one minute. But uh, yeah. no, that's really, really cool. Uh, you know, obviously anything's open to manipulation, but, you know, you've got to start somewhere. And, yeah. you know, the fact that, you know, we're, we're sliding into 2022 and, you know, if, if the t newest technology can result in potentially some of the oldest technology becoming you know, uh, selling like gangbusters. What a, what a beautiful meeting of two, jet, uh, or should I say two, com you know, completely uh, the printing press versus the internet uh, yeah. and the, the two are entwined. Interesting, interesting. Let's see how that all works. Well, I'm gonna have a look at this after. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, you just have to uh, jump on to uh, books plus publishing. So there you go. So that's my kind of news for the day. There's so much going on. There's uh, short lists and there's, uh, competitions and all sorts of things. But let's think about uh, Nicole Kelly's interview and tell us a little bit about her book because I want to talk about some of the the um, things that it brings up. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Well, first of all, it was just so much fun talking with Nicole. And look, the, the subject of her book and then the concept, the idea is such a cool one. So Nicole Kelly has really turned a little bit of history on its head and had some super fun because her book Lament is uh, described as following. So this will give you a really good idea of, of uh, the, the fun waiting for you within the pages. Lament is a rollicking ride, a historical fiction reimagining of the Kelly story if the siege at Glen Rowan had gone differently. In June 1880, the reign of the Kelly gang ended, guns blazing of course, in a fiery siege at the Glen Rowan Inn. Ned Kelly survived, only to be hanged four months later. In this reimagining of Australia's most notorious bushranger, Ned is given the chance to keep his band of brothers together and build a better life. 
What unfolds is the human side of four outlaws who are remembered as much for their anarchy and rebellion as their crimes. Ned Kelly, the life that might have been, the future he dreamed of. Such is life. Mm. And a little bit of praise for Lament because it's a, you know, it's a very popular book. It's a, mm-hmm. a Hawkeye Prize winner. Uh, so one of the comments, one of the uh, reviews I've seen is deserving of a miniseries adaption. Nicole Kelly and Hawkeye have done Australia folk, sorry, Australian folk history proud. Lament cleverly weaving fact and fiction together, staying true to history and vision, all while being respectful to those involved. And of course, that's one of the Hawkeye book reviews. And uh, another one reads, Nicole Kelly writes with such engaging old world charm, you'll be immediately pulled into discovering the person Ned Kelly might have been. If you've ever wondered what might have happened if the Kelly gang lived on, this is the heartbreaking read for you. So that gives you a good idea of what you can expect with Lament and what a fantastic project to take on. Very interesting. And it is phenomenal how well known, I guess, the the Kelly gang um, and Ned Kelly himself are in Australia. I mean, it it's that kind of, he's the epitome of the underdog trope, isn't he? Well, it's definitely symbolic of that. I think it's one of our very first symbols as far as the culture is concerned. Yeah. Uh, being such a young culture, um, yeah. you know, realistically... The European cults, yeah. yeah. You know, uh, we'd, we'd probably... You'd, you'd jump from... Oh, I don't know, you'd jump from Ned Kelly to Chopper Reed, I, I think, if you had to draw a line. I'm sure we've got some <laughs> infamous uh, criminals yeah. in between, but yeah. uh, has anyone else ca- sort of uh, integrated their way into our culture so much? And it's also interesting that he brings up two sides. So the, the opinion's really divided. You know, some see him as a kind of loyal son and defender of his people. Others see him as a criminal and a murderer. And, you know, the Victorian police, um, I've read some bits about, are still very opposed to him, because, partly because he killed three of their men and partly because of what he said about them. Um, so tough, you know, out in, you know, early European settlement in Australia at 14, arrested for assault. Um, and then a year later, arrested again for being an accomplice of uh, another bush ranger. But then he's, you know, he's caught the attention of police. So it's, it's really challenging. And, you know, the fact that uh, it was also mentioned that if he was, oh, where did I say this? Something about that if he was um, arrested today, that he he would get off <laughs> because oh, okay. um, he'd get off on the self defence or something. I can't think where I, I read it, but it yeah, it was really interesting. I thought, oh yeah, okay. So if he was supported by you know law today, that that he would possibly get off. So um, I mean, he certainly wouldn't get um, hanged because we don't have capital punishment here uh, in Australia. So yeah, interesting. But do you think do you think one of the and I mean probably going straight for stating the obvious here, but do you think one of the reasons uh, the Kelly name has, has become so infamous throughout our history is it is one of the earliest examples of standing up to authority because oh, uh, absolutely. Be, yeah I mean obviously yeah. c- since the time to Kelly to today can you think of one instance where any police officer has put their hand up and said oh, I admit being corrupt N- never but we know there is corruption so the, the only logical conclusions from that is some police lie <laughs> and so if some police lie which they obviously do that makes it really difficult considering they're the ones with the guns and power so but i think, I think it's still all a powerful humans, thing because i don't think that ned was um blameless in you know there are choices that we make all the way through um lives but yeah it's, it's interesting that we became so obsessed with him and when you think about the european settlement of australia so many uh convicts and you know, the lower class of British people, you know, sent out to sink or swim, basically. Let's just handball them, get rid of them somewhere else and let them do whatever. And, you know, authority, not necessarily fabulous, no. at looking after them and, you know, people coming out with an eye to their own advantage. So just you think of the... Um, I guess the environment that they're all living in and it wasn't the green hills of Ireland or, you know, and it wasn't the, the small villages where they supported each other. Just so different. In fact, I've just, um, uh, hubby, as you know, does a lot of uh, family history stuff and we've just researched some on my side of the family who were from Ireland, came out from uh, Letterkenny, Donegal, 
Ruffin, a few places around there, and realised when we looked at one family who the first child was born in Ireland, the rest of them were born out here. There were 10 kids, but in 1875, I think it was, three of them died within three weeks of each other. We thought, oh, what, what's that all about? And there was a scarlet fever epidemic. So it oh. just then gives you an idea that, oh, there's three little kids. You know, they would not have been, he was a, a bootmaker, I think this one, if I get that right. But, you know, how hard was life when your children, you know, and you lost three kids through, you know, no fault of your own. And just it just brought a whole different, flavor to me just looking at them thinking oh well, yeah they're my ancestors but then if i think what nicole has done has just put life into some of those legends you know put some some fiction in behind the fact and i think that's uh, brave of it to do because it is such a, a famous story mm. um but yeah fascinating yeah and look obviously that that uh, inspires a conversation about why we here in Australia, and well, look, here in Australia, I think in other countries too, but we do uh, admire a, a good criminal or a, a, we do. a good, a good bad guy. <laughs> but I think back then, if, if you're robbing a bank, say, you know, 1870, 1880, yeah. um, it's not to get yourself a holiday apartment on the Gold Coast and splash well, cash no. at Jupiter's. It's, <laughs> it was probably for survival. I, I yeah. can't imagine there many shops around then where you could no. you know, have a good time with your money. Like uh, basically it would have just been food and building supplies. Yeah, I'm, I'm that's guessing. it. And uh, a hard, hard lives, you know, not, you know, I'm not saying that people don't have hard lives today, but it's so difficult to imagine the, the lives, you know, and they're being cast as outlaws and yeah. Yeah, but it but it is interesting that we do love bad guys or bad mm -hmm. characters, should I say? Uh, obviously, true crime is a massive genre. Uh, it pretty much has its own channels now. Uh, the books, you know, obviously massive. I I remember reading a funny statistic about. Uh, I think I might have even mentioned the interview with uh, Chopper Reed's books being the most stolen book of all the books, <laughs> which was kind of you know the perfect sort of snake chasing its own tail. Um, but I, I, I the Ouroboros, was, which I know from T. S. Simons. There you uh, go. Books. Yes. <laughs> but I, I was reading somewhere the other day that was you know just having a bit of a look into why we might do that. I mean, I've got my personal reasons, and everyone has their own personal reasons. But a couple of points brought up was that you know. As far as when we're reading a character is concerned, the protagonist is usually bound by rules. So if they're a good character, they follow the law, they do what's right. So, you know, in essence, there's a huge sense of predictability to a certain extent. Whereas if you have a, an evil character or, you know, a, a hardened criminal character, someone who obviously flouts the law, then that character is unpredictable and anything mm. is possible. Mm. And maybe that taps into our desire to be free. I mean, we uh, as humans, we're constantly stopping ourselves doing things really to a certain degree. Uh, I mean, we'd love to just not go to work, but we go to work. Um, you know, little things like that. We'd love to just run the red light. No one else is around. You know, why sit there like a sheep waiting for the little stick to tap your bum? But no, you got yeah. to do it. Yeah. Um, so a part of us at some point, you'd think, oh, it'd be good to break the rules for a little while just to be free and just to, you know, wonder what would happen. Well, this is that outlet, I think, is what would happen if you break the rules. And uh, I don't know. That's I thought that had a, quite a bit of merit. What, what, were you, what would your thoughts be on why we love you know why hold our criminals to such high esteem i mean well, there's a brand new mel oh is the sydney one this one that you know a series coming out uh, australian series on uh, gangsters and, and whatnot uh yeah, so we just which, love it well you might just love it it's not the kind of thing that i would necessarily watch so i'm i'm not much for the gangsters and the bad guys i i yeah Give me fantasy and a bit more magic any day. But interestingly, I read on Iron Outlaw, so I'm going to tell you about somebody else's views. So ironoutlaw.com, which is a bit of a, a history uh, a thing, and it's got a lot of Ned Kelly necessarily, uh, of course, talks about Australia's convict and colonial heritage fostered affinity for the anti-hero. So if you look up um, yeah, ironlaw.com, you'll see lots of bits and pieces there. And, you know, they talk even about the Australian government kind of shanghaiing and proper making the Kelly ethos, I guess, you know, building that white Australian um, culture because it was such a young European culture um, using uh, that because so many of the uh, 
the people. You know, the convicts and settlers were illiterate. Folk songs and oral traditions were central to preserving information. And that kind of folk identity as resilient people who laugh in the face of adversity, face up to great difficulties and deliberately go against authority and establishment and who value egalitarianism and mateship. That's what they say, you know, sort of become uh, sort of embedded in the old traditions. And so the, the, the horrors of the penal colony a colony was sort of, you know, well publicised in, in ballads and things throughout the British Empire. Um, and even, you know, talked about the horrors of transportation, the convict convict, uh, sorry, the suffering convict. Um, there's a quote they talk uh describing the equalising nature of Australia for fresh immigrants of different classes, the famous Australian poet Henry Lawson wrote, I really quite like this, but the curse of class distinctions from our shoulders shall be hurled. There'll be higher education for the toiling, starving clown and the rich and educated shall be educated down. Oh, that's a cool little that twist, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so it's that, you know, the common man had more of a chance here in Australia. You know, there was less class-driven stuff than they'd come from uh, in Britain and all those kind of things. So, yeah, many of us came from, uh, you know, from, from convict or from younger sons. You know, some of the uh, my mum's side of the family were younger sons who weren't going to inherit anything or who'd been mischievous we'll just say uh or didn't want to join uh, religious uh groups that kind of thing they were going right well you're off to australia see you later so you know we ended up with a, a whole mishmash of people who were i won't say not good enough but who were not who didn't fit into the class society or didn't fit into where we were told to fit so yeah i guess it's not surprising that we you know we like his jurillery manifesto, you know, if a poor man happened to leave his horse or a bit of a potty calf outside his paddock, they'd be impounded. I've known over 60 head of horses impounded in one day, all belonging to poor farmers. So, you know, cattle and sheep stealing, all those kind of things. Yeah, interesting that Ned felt the need to write that, you know, what is it, 3,000 word manifesto or something that he left before they hung him. Oh, I, I can't say I've ever read that one. Ah, there you go. So it's it's interesting that um, oh, you can see uh, you can go into the archives and and have a look and see uh, the history. So, born in Beveridge in 1855, he died in the gallows at Melbourne Jail in 1880. So he was only what's that? 25, 35. How's my maths? 25. 25. Yep. The eldest son of eight children. Uh, so he would have had the older son, you know, thinking thinking about him. As a child, he saved another boy from drowning and the boy's family awarded him a green silk sash in recognition of his bravery. And this is, I'm sure, where Nicole's book comes in. He was believed to have been romantically involved with his cousin, Kate Lloyd, whom he visited just days before the siege in Glen Rowan and, Steve's Hart, and Steve Hart's sister, Eddie Hart. So, um, yeah, he wrote um, the Gerildery letter. Oh, sorry, it was an 8,000 word manifesto in which he justified his crimes and exposed what he viewed as unfair police persecution of himself and his family. So he dictated the letter to Joe Byrne and he who rewrote it in neater handwriting. So there you go. Well, the question, I guess, coming from hear, hearing something like that with a manifesto and, and obviously talking about, uh, I guess, sometimes the unfair or overreach of the police, we, do we need, the question I have is, do we need a Ned Kelly today? Uh, because you know there are things happening that uh, because the the people that follow the rules aren't the ones that are going to challenge the rules mm. you know as a general rule <laughs> there you go how many rules can you have in one conversation but um, <laughs> you know because now it, you know realistically it's mostly an economical cost now you know that's that's the risk of trying to step outside and change anything you know uh, but so for example you know these new laws they're bringing in where that without a warrant or without any documentation signed by a judge, the police can actually infiltrate your your technology. So they can go into your, for example, your Facebook sign in, you know, as you, and they can, I think the law says, whether it's passed or not, I don't know they're trying to do it, they can take information, delete information, but they can also alter information. So, which means something can be put into your digital landscape 
and then potentially you could be accused for harboring that information or, or whatever it might be. So the, the manipulation from behind the scenes is becoming legal from the standpoint of the people that make the law. Mm. Uh, so do we do we need a digital net, Kelly? Uh, do we need something? Uh, I think we do. I think, you know, at the moment things are, you know, the sense of control is becoming intoxicating out there. For the, for the people in control because they're definitely drunk. They're not doing much else <laughs> except setting rules. Uh, well, so yeah, do, where, do, where's our to, new Ned Kelly? Yeah, but maybe I'll, I'll just call on that a little bit. I, I think I'm probably more optimistic in this way. And I think about the, you know, that uh, Margaret Mead quote that, you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I think there are many small... Uh, groups of thoughtful, committed citizens out there changing the world. So, yeah, and look, we are in a mess at the moment. Let's just put it out there for sure. And our politicians have a lot to answer for, not only here in Australia, but, you know, around the world. And it, I think this pandemic has called out some of the, the shadow side or the the poor organisation and, you know, the, the motivations and values of people have been really challenged. So, yeah, it's interesting. Well, not only that, I think it's, um, without getting too political, and, I'm, and it's, this is more a social thing than it's political, but, you know, all the people out there that, you know, do the right thing, pay their taxes, work mm. hard, mm. you know, uh, contribute to society, try and shop local, you know, do all those yeah. things, register yeah. the car, follow the speed limit, you know, follow the lockdown advice, all, all this sort of stuff. That, you know, with today's technology, the reward is you get to sit there and you can see for a fact that th this never ending corruption within the government where they're just lining their pockets with money, the never ending corruption within the police all across Australia and the different ways they're extending. I mean, you know, uh, strip searches in Sydney for underage kids, you know, where does that it is, end for yeah. there? Uh, then we see criminals you know known criminal family well they're known criminal family but they're still driving around lamborghinis how's that even possible mm. you know if i accidentally get a little bit of money deposited in my bank account you know they're going to be all over it where'd you get it you know uh, whereas so from a from a you know from the, the population in australia that does the right thing they're surrounded by everyone doing the wrong thing that includes the people that are making the law the people to enforce the law and then you know the people that are flouting the law uh, I mean, look, look at today, at the time of today's recording, we've got, uh, what, the Attorney General saying, oh, I don't know who gave me a million dollars. Oh, yeah, he's not the Attorney General anymore. <laughs> I'm not, not anymore, is he? No. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, wow. So I can just say, mm. oh, that that was just anonymous donors. It's all right. Um, you know, not drug money at all. It's, uh, but I, well, I couldn't tell you if it is or not, but uh, it's completely legal. You know, these things. So we. One thing to do, throw do into that. Yeah. Is that, you know, I listened to Phil Hawes' um, uh, excerpt, uh, Horror, I think, you know, something ah, about yes. his, America's Paranoia. Well, and and it was really book. interesting that he talked about the history of how we now just listen to bad news, how the newspapers and magazines all made stuff up, you know, many years ago. But that, you know, that kind of news cycle is focused on the bad stuff so you know the yes the you know the corruption within police the corruption within crime families the poor things that are done to people and it's really hard to sell um media with good news stories yes and so up that which means that uppermost in our mind is all of that corruption is that five percent rather than the 95 percent of say you know police who are out there trying to keep us safe and and you know make the traffic work and respond to accidents and those kind of things so there are fantastic police out there but we focus on that five percent and uh you know the the crime family oh, i don't know if they're good crime families yeah i don't know if, <laughs> i think my logic's just fallen well, over well there's, well, there's a, it, there's a really lot of high-end criminals in australia <laughs> that, that are have got obvious wealth and probably haven't had a job for the last 10 years how does it how does that work yeah you know. so perhaps we better leave the the yeah. next conversation to nicole and jump yeah, into her interview <laughs> because there you go it's very see it, where she takes uh, yeah. ned kelly and his family yeah, because just even that brief conversation we've had, there's no uh, simple line that divides, is there? Between, no, it really you know, does challenge the way person. you think about right and wrong and whether you are a follow the rules kind of person or, you know, what's the line that would mean you stepped outside the rules? Yeah, I think that's probably what 
I often think about in terms of Ned Kelly that how he was driven, you know, through uh, the context of situations forced into crime beyond the situation beyond his control. Um, what would push you out of control? But anyway, let's go with Nicole. Yes. So without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, may I present the super, the fantastic, the absolutely splendid and eternally fun Nicole Kelly. Our next guest is the best-selling author of a Hawkeye Prize-winning novel called Lament. And Lament is described as a rollicking ride, a historical fiction reimagining of the Kelly story if the siege at Glen Rowan had gone differently. So, Nicole Kelly, thank you so much for joining us on the Australian Book Lovers podcast. How are you? Good, Darren. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. I'm uh, itching to have a chat about your book because it's it's such a fascinating concept. Uh, I have heard it described or have read it described as faction. So a uh, yes. <laughs> fiction and factual hybrid. And I uh, also understand the book's in its second run. But I'd never come across the word faction before. Was it something that you n- knew existed? Had you seen that type of literature before? No. Well, I hadn't known the name for it. I think um, Carolyn had written that name, who's my editor. and um, it, But it suits it perfectly, I think, because it really is a fictional story but I'm a historian by trade, a history teacher. And so I really do like to sort of dig down into that historical aspect and it is based on lots of facts. So it kind of weaves its way in and out of uh, between fact and fiction, which I really like. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, for our listeners out there, I thought I might just read a very brief synopsis of your novel Lament, just so uh, we understand what we're gonna be talking about. Because as I mentioned, it, it is a fascinating concept. Now, the the synopsis is that in June 1880, the reign of the Kelly gang ended, guns blazing in a fiery siege at the Glen Rowan Inn. Ned Kelly survived, only to be hanged four months later. In this reimagining of Australia's most notorious bush ranger, Ned is given the chance to keep his band of brothers together and build a better life. What unfolds is the human side of four outlaws who are remembered as much for their anarchy and rebellion as their crimes. Ned Kelly, the life that might have been, the future he dreamed of, such is life. (laughs) It's, uh, yeah, that's, if that doesn't grab everyone out there, I don't know what does. Um, Yes, as as a Kelly fan, I always like the such is life at the end. (laughs) (laughs) And it's become such a, uh, such a common term in Australia, hasn't it? It has, yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised it hasn't been like a beer or something that's brought out just called such as life. But anyway, <laughs> now I, I thought opening up the discussion with you, I, I wanted to come from a little bit of left field because reading that synopsis and, you know, seeing how you know successful it's been, so successful, bestseller, second edition, uh, second run already. Um, and I was thinking it, it, it drew me back to something. It's a little bit odd, but a couple of weeks ago, we actually went and saw a one-off re-screening of the original Nightmare Elm Street. Okay. Which, which I actually originally saw in the cinema back in the day and it scared me way too much. <laughs> and what we found, well, we found it odd because the, the cinema was packed and there was just so many kids in there. And, and I was like, what the? And, but then it got me thinking that, of course, somehow from the Nightmare on Elm Street, which is essentially about a child killer, yeah. that uh, antagonist beca- became a, a source of cartoons for children, uh, records, Christmas albums, you know, completely celebrated by people of all ages. Now, I, I guess that's when it comes to books, it's a similar thing in Australia with, for example, Chopper Reed's books, uh, which yeah. became so popular. And, and he is a, uh, you know, an admitted criminal and someone who definitely lived life on the wild side. And I also understand Chopper's books were the most stolen books for a while there, uh, as far, <laughs> far as theft goes. Um, now, and, you know, obviously when it comes to writing, there was a lot of stuff, you know, from you're in Victoria. So a lot of stuff about the Melbourne Underground or, you know, and the Underbelly that led to the Underbelly series. Mm. So there's always been a celebration of, you know, these, the ragged characters. Um, so I'm wondering from your perspective, do you think that this sort of popularity comes from a subconscious desire to see good in people or, or the hope that some sort of redemption is possible for, you know, for even the darkest of hearts? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm not sure. For me, I think it's about seeing them as more than one dimensional characters. 
So for me, like particularly with Ned, I haven't watched Nightmare on Elm Street because I'm a bit of a chicken. I don't like <laughs> horror movies. So, so um, scary, the rest aren't. So that's, that's but I did, for Ned, it's seeing him as, there's often that argument, is he a villain or is he a hero? And, mm-hmm. you know, the truth has to lie somewhere in the middle of it, doesn't it? Because you're right, he's a criminal, he's a killer, and the boys all were. And I think it's seeing them as more than that one-dimensional figure. And, and they were just boys. And, um, you know, with all the mistakes that we make as human. And I think that's what draws us to it, that, you know, as humans, we so often make mistakes in our own lives. And yet, you know, by whatever we believe in, uh, that there is redemption on the other side of it or the fact that you know we've made bad choices but just by sheer good luck it's gone the the right way and we haven't had to pay the consequences for those bad choices and and i think um for the gang members and ned in particular the bad choices led from one thing to another and they got in deeper and deeper and and you can see how one looking back in hindsight how one bad choice leads to something else which leads to the next event and and it's tragic in a way and so i figure that that tragedy that we we see in others we can almost imagine for ourselves in the choices that we've made does that make sense yeah no i think you've raised a really good point especially with the idea that one event can then you know lead to another event lead to another event and just spiral out of control i think that is one of the reasons I, I think that you know the the edgy characters are sometimes so popular or you know for example why uh the ned kelly story has you know been such a treasured you know uh part of australia's history is because if, if somebody is a victim of circumstance in a way then we we can imagine ourselves being in that situation and perhaps being in the same shoes were those yes. circumstances same set of circumstances placed upon us yeah exactly and i mean there's just so much the kelly story is still so widely through literature and and pop culture in australia it's really quite amazing and i don't think i even imagined i didn't realize how much it was still prevalent in um today's culture until i sort of had it published and have gone onto this ride of sort of marketing and meeting people and um how much is out there it's really phenomenal and tell me when it came to writing the book and so you obviously already had somewhat of a, a passion and a knowledge of Ned Kelly's story. Was there anything that, you know, very surprising came out of any of your research? So for example, did you discover something that completely blew you away that you never knew? I'm not sure about completely blew me away. I was a really big um, Kelly fan growing up. I grew up in Northeast Victoria, so it was sort of under the shadow of the Kelly story and everyone up there has uh, has a story from the kellys whether it be that their you know great grandmother's horse was stolen at one stage or <laughs> um everyone's related in some way or another but um doing the research for it i think what came through particularly from being able to use things like trove with all of the newspaper articles that you have access to and reading um information from the day was that you get a real sense of the people and reading his Um, the words of the court transcript for me was probably the most powerful um, bit of research that I did that I just, I sat there just reading every word so many times thinking, my goodness, you know, that's actually what he said. And there's so many myths, I guess, and, and urban legends that go on around the Kelly gang that um, to be able to read the actual words or the derivatory letter, which were the actual words that he said, it, it really brings you back to the person that he was um, which I really enjoyed as a, as a historian, especially, but, uh, it also gave you interesting insight into him to be able to write, obviously it's from his, his perspective. So to write from first person perspective from Ned was difficult being a, um, a modern woman, I guess, but, uh, being able to read his actual words was really interesting to take you into his insight. Yeah, that's incredible. And the, the benefits of, you know, or, or the cool things about Trove has come up in the podcast before, but I never for the life of me would have imagined that there'd be that sort of information or, or you know, actual spoken words from Ned Kelly himself to be found there. Yeah, it's phenomenal, really. And so how far back was, is it a case of actual newspapers from that time? or was Yeah, it just... newspapers from the era, yes. Yeah, yeah. so um, the Kelly siege was in 1880 mm-hmm. and lament sort of starts from there so i don't delve into all the previous um growing up of the kellys it literally starts on the night of the glen rowan siege so 
I hadn't even research before that obviously but um but the story itself starts from from the night of the siege so that was yeah it was interesting and through then to the um what happened to them afterwards yeah that it must have been super fun to start a story from from the siege and, and delve into such a you know iconic character uh, now i understand that lament took almost seven years from concept to, uh, sorry from concept to publication is that right yeah, it did. It did. I was very naive. I guess I hadn't really written um, a lot before. And I went on maternity leave and thought to myself, oh, that's a really good idea for a story. And like, surely it wouldn't take that long to write. To write. And it really did. So it took seven years from, um, and as you would know, as a writer and um, people listening that the first draft that you write, when I put my pen down and went, oh, great, I'm done. Obviously, that's a long way off uh, from when it got published and the number of major edits um, and revisions that it had, uh, it took a while. <laughs> yeah. I think when you finish the first draft, uh, for me, symbolically, it's like, yes, you've just tied up your boots. Now you can start climbing up that mountain. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's been really lovely because I've actually printed off each of the edits because um, I like to read um, a hard copy and edit on hard copy and so um, in my stash of um, pile of writing things I have all of the different edits that have been done and I pulled out the first one the other day and compared it to the book and just went oh my goodness you wouldn't even recognize it as the same story and I think that gives me hope with any of my writing I do going forward that uh, that's how much it can change there's hope. Wow, that must be uh, truly something awesome to be able to look at that the very first and the, and the final product and to see all those changes. How many drafts do you think were involved in before the actual final publication? Oh, there was, um, so I went through three major structural rewrites. Um, mm -hmm. The story started off actually as um, multi-perspective, so from multiple perspectives of um, different characters. And um, after I got some editing done and had it read by some people, uh, the feedback was that it needed to come from one perspective. And so obviously we worked that through Ned. But um, yeah, it was three major ones. And then obviously the little bits and pieces that you do multiple times going through. And then once it went to Hawkeye and I worked with Carolyn from Hawkeye, um, we sent it out to some more beta readers and had a bit more feedback about ways I could sort of add depth to the story and themes that ran through it. And, and so rewriting some scenes for that was really a great process as well. But, uh, and obviously a really hard line edit <laughs> because <laughs> being a teacher, I should know better than, but my tense work was awful. So. <laughs> oh, but at least you, I'm assuming you've, you've got a mad skills with a red pen though. Oh, yes. I'm great at editing. Yes. Like the killing the words. I have no problem with that. <laughs> now, you mentioned that originally it was a multi-perspective and then was honed into uh, Ned Kelly's perspective. Yes. How did you find that affected the way you wrote as far as did you find it easier to, for, to do one rather than the other? Or was it sim a simple shift or did it ch completely, you know, when you shifted to a single person's view, did it, did it change a lot about how you were telling the story in the sense of, I guess, you know, the visualizations, because for multi multiple people, you, you can see settings and different locations that obviously you yeah. can't if there's just one person, because they may not be in that location. So was it a, a really big, difficult change or something that you enjoyed? Um, I did enjoy it, but it was really difficult. I found it, I'd never um, expected it all to be written from Ned's perspective. So uh, there was... Uh, about five now, I think five different perspectives, including Joe Byrne, who was another member of the gang and um, Kate Kelly, who was Ned's sister. And I really enjoyed those aspects of seeing and hearing the story from everybody else's point of view. And so I did enjoy writing that initially, but um, when I got the feedback on it, the editor said, you know, why have you chosen to do this? And there was no other reason other than, oh, well, it was easier because it told the story that I wanted to tell. Um, and when she said, look, you need to look at it from a different perspective. And I thought, well, it has to be Ned's. It changed the story a lot because obviously you can only see it through his eyes. Um, but it also, it meant I had to stop being so much of a lazy writer, I guess. And it sounds a bit funny, but I felt like I had to work harder to tell the story that I wanted to tell through his perspective. And that meant I had to really beef up my secondary characters and have their interactions be a lot more honest and open. And so it was a great process to do, but it was tricky to do because it's sort of, I was learning along the way of how to go about writing a story that I wanted to tell from this different perspective. So yeah, it was in interesting. 
Interesting, but there's no denying that the that the choice to do that to, was very you know very successful choice because obviously the book has has been nothing but success. So that's that's a fantastic uh, aspect of that whole writing process that the ability to you know take advice or or discuss changes and then do, make those changes. And in this case, it's worked out fantastic for you. Yeah, and for me to go forward, thinking about really carefully about who my protagonist is going to be so whose perspective am I going to be writing from I really thought about that a lot deeper this time when I've been writing versus the first time where I just kind of wrote because that's I just dived in whereas I've been able to think about it a bit more and and plan out why I would be telling the story from this person's perspective and what it's going to look like so yeah it's been a good lesson excellent and and speaking of lessons look you know seven years Obviously, that's a lot of work from concept and publication, but I'm wondering when you when you began the story, you had a passion for Ned Kelly. I understand you had you know the concept in your head of what you wanted to write, but when it came to the research, which I'm sure was always going to be on the table, when you began the process, was did you already have an idea about the approach that your research was going to take, or was it a case of you had a starting platform and then essentially taught yourself as you as you continued to put the book together? Yeah, a bit, a bit of that. <laughs> so I had some background knowledge. Um, I love Ian Jones as a researcher and his books that he's written. So primarily I read his books um, about Ned and about the relationship of the boys and the gang and had read them multiple times before growing up. And so I sort of had that background knowledge and that's what launched me into the story. But once I had to get in a bit deeper and think about um, actual things that had happened at the time and conversations that might have happened and um, what... Ned's words were in the jewelry letter and that sort of thing having to go back and I I wrote the draft first and then I went back and researched on top of it and kind of added in the depth and the details to it I found it too hard to research and write at the same time um, oh, okay. particularly that first draft I found I had enough background knowledge to get a first draft out um, and then had to go back and research because I find that because I love history so much that I dive down into this research and then I come up hours later going, oh, well, that's not what I wanted to find out, but gosh, that was interesting <laughs> or uh, just rabbit holes of research. So if I did that while I was actually writing a first draft, I would never get anything written. Well, so, so really the, the research does have a pr profound effect on which way your story is going. So I could definitely see or understand that once you've got the, uh, the, the research you need, to, to then write and then, you know, perhaps looking more down the track. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you talked about Trove. Was, was there any tricks or any advice given to you? Like, did you interview people of the town? Uh, anything odd that you, you found yourself doing as part of the research? No, I didn't interview anybody. Um, I really did rely on the Ian Jones and the Trove and through um, photographs and, you know, obviously descriptions of characters um, because they were real people. I wanted to, get those descriptions right. So I had lots of photographs of people um, from the time and from the gang and, um, you know, the judge, Redmond Barry, and, and that sort of thing that I was able to use to refer to. Um, one of the really lovely things about getting it published and uh, has been meeting people that are actually related to the Kellys. Oh, wow. The Burns and the Hearts. And that has been just amazing being able to speak to those people after the fact. And I'm very, very grateful to their kindness that they've been... Um, really receptive to the story and and that's been a lovely aspect of it though because i hadn't actually spoken to any relatives prior to writing it and i'm actually really glad now because i think i would have been terrified <laughs> to uh to have written it but having written it and then being able to speak to people it's been lovely people have been so welcoming um and kind about their their praise of the book which is lovely yeah, that, that, that must be such a beautiful thing. I, I can imagine there's a lot of people that live around that, you know, the, the township uh, where the Cali gang harbour from. I'm sure many of them read the book, so it must be super fun when you bump into somebody and, and can ask how, how it came across or hear their feedback uh, in, from, from people that are passionate about the Kellys themselves rather than, you know, obviously a review online is fantastic. But yeah, to be able to talk right. to someone and, and hear passionately, you know, how much they enjoyed it, that must be wonderful. It was lovely. Um, obviously, the book was released in 2020, and that was in the year of Zoom. And so we got to release it um, on a Zoom launch. And it was great because we had, you know, 60 people turn up and lots of family and friends from all over the country. And it was fabulous. But right at the end of um, the chat with between um, the publisher and myself and a couple of panel members, um, this lady piped up and said, oh, hi, I'm Nolene, and um, I'm related to 
both the hearts and the Kellys. Um, and I just, honestly, I shrunk in my chair. I was horrified. I thought, oh my goodness, this lady really? is going to um, be scathing in about this book. And she was absolutely lovely and just has been a real, um, I've been able to go and meet her and have chatted with her a lot over different things um, in the book and with the Kelly gang, because her knowledge, she's, she's really into her family history and into history in general. So her knowledge is incredible in that area. Um, and one of the things I loved most was uh, in Lament, Ned has a um, relationship with Etty Hart, who is Steve Hart's sister, because who else would date a bush ranger other than a bush ranger's sister? I mean, it made perfect sense to me. And it was a rumor that I'd come across during research. Oh, okay. And I just love the idea that he would be with Steve's sister. Cause I could imagine, you know, I could see how they would collide and, and be together, but I could also imagine how Steve would just, that would grate him completely because nobody wants their sister with their best mate really. So no, no, I, um, <laughs> I just thought it was the perfect uh, relationship. And so I wrote that into Lament. And when I spoke to Nolene, I said to her, oh, I've always, you know, was there any truth to this? And she just said, no. Oh. <laughs> so I was completely <laughs> shut down, but I did in my heart. Ned will always be with Eddie because that's what the story was. <laughs> well, and I guess look, you just never can really know that there may have been something there that just never made its way through time. That's it. I just hold out hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, with the, discussing obviously the Kelly gang and the book lament, I, I, I'm just thinking, either now or in the near future, I'm sure we're going to have some international listeners of the podcast. And so I'm wondering, there's probably no better person than yourself. Are you able to maybe condense into one minute the, the what the siege of Ned Kelly, you know, what it was and, and it's why it's had got a big, big impact on Australia? Um, well, the siege happened at Glen Rowan and it was right at the end of the Kelly gang. So the Kellys up until then, they had been robbing some banks and they had obviously... Um, police had been shot and killed at Stringybark Creek and so they were murderers by this time they were on the run in the northeast of Victoria um, and it came to a head at Glen Rowan so they had in fact killed Aaron Sherritt um, up towards Beechworth and uh, it was luring the police train who knew they knew the police would come up with Sherritt being killed because he was a traitor though he had been an incredible friend and almost a brother to them um, and so the police train was coming up and got to Glen Rowan and the school teacher, Thomas Kerno, had flagged the train down and stopped the train uh, before it could be derailed because the boys had actually got the rails lifted further just past Glen Rowan town um, and had planned to derail the train. And so it was stopped and there was then a shootout at Glen Rowan and uh, the boys other than Ned were killed and Ned was captured and then hung a couple of months later. Uh, so that's why it really was pivotal, that moment of the siege for the Kellys up until then, they were still on the run. And um, the fact, I, that's where the, the start of the story was, was that Thomas Kerno being the teacher had actually um, flagged down the train. And um, it was for me that pivotal moment of, okay, had he not let Thomas Kerno go, uh, Thomas Kerno walked with a limp, he had a wife who was heavily pregnant and I'm assuming that uh, as in the story that he just thought he wasn't much of a threat, um, this sort of mild mannered teacher. But in the end, he was in fact the hero that flagged down the train. Uh, yeah. So it was a really pivotal moment for them. And, and for me, lament sort of starts there with that. What if, what if they hadn't let Thomas Kerno go? What if the train hadn't been flagged down and it had been derailed? What would have happened next? Wow. And there is a little bit of serendipity there too, of course, because yourself, you are a teacher and you're bringing to life this story. Yeah, exactly. It has, I've found lots of those moments. I hadn't realized at the time, but Thomas Kerno actually moved to Ballarat um, and taught in Ballarat for quite a long time and is buried in Ballarat. So, um, and I live uh, near Ballarat. Um, and so for me, that was sort of another nice thread there. Oh, wow. Yeah. This, there can often be lots of little magical oddness that comes from when you're writing a book or when you finish a book or even when yeah. you're thinking of putting a story together uh I, I call it the little green light so when life gives you those or the universe gives you those little signs to say yep keep going uh, <laughs> <laughs> and obviously if there's a red light stop but i haven't seen a red light yet <laughs> no no thank goodness <laughs> uh, now amazingly i uh, i understand and i hope i'm correct me if i'm wrong but i understand lament is actually your very first book which um is a huge inspiration for for any writer out there really uh so i was wondering if you could maybe 
grace us with some of the insights uh, into your journey to, to be published and, and maybe some of the tribulations and also the, the, the golden pieces of wisdom that you might have discovered along the way. Oh, I'm not sure that there's golden pieces of wisdom. But... Oh, damn it. I, want... <laughs> I had my pen ready. But you're right. It, it was, it, that's my first um, full novel that I had written. I had written a manuscript back in high school, which was called Skeletons in the Closet and was all about skeletons in the closet. So I wasn't uh, <laughs> a great writer really at that stage, but I, I really enjoyed writing and I just had always been pottering around stories and then when the idea for the novel had come I thought oh you know why not um I think I'd never imagined that it would actually be published I had assumed that there was probably that many Kelly stories out there it wouldn't find a market and you know how many Kelly stories can there be and so I thought you know I'll get it finished pop it in the top drawer and um I'll tell the kids one day that I wrote a book and uh, as it happened, I sent out the first, um, must have been one of the first drafts to some friends who are teachers and um, they were lovely and they read it and some feedback to them from them was, you know, this is great. You've got to do something with it. And I think their feedback sort of spurred me on to go, okay, well, maybe there is something in here worth worth having a look at and keeping on going with. And from there, I didn't know what to do with it. And not being a writer, I've never done a writing I've done short courses and, um, but I've never sort of studied writing and I, I didn't really know what to do with it after that. So um, the best thing I did was actually take it to an editor and I took it to an editor locally um, in Ballarat called Alison Arnold and she's fabulous. And she gave me great feedback, both, you know, critical and um, positive uh, feedback about what to do with it next. And um, that included sort of writing it from the one perspective. And she said, you know, actually your dialogue sounds really good and authentic. So, you know, keep that aspect. And she was fabulous. So being able to sit down with somebody externally was for me the greatest um, thing that moved the story forward. Mm -hmm. And that would be my recommendation to anyone would be just get somebody that's, um, that is in the writing field that does know their stuff that can have a look at your book and, and have a look at your manuscript and really push it forward. And they're not afraid to hurt your feelings because I gave that first draft to my mum and she said, Oh, well, that's lovely. <laughs> so which she says about everything that I write, she, yeah. she can't give me that critical feedback. So as lovely it was to hear from her that she really enjoyed it. Um, it's yeah, that's, not the same that's a goal as, on the scoreboard that comes yeah. pretty easy. <laughs> but it's not the same as getting that critical feedback. So getting that was the thing that moved it forward. And, um, once I'd redrafted it, then it sat there again and I thought, okay, what do I do with it now? And I sent it out to a couple of, um, publishers and, um, waited and waited and waited and didn't hear anything back. And of course that's, as everyone would know, that is querying, that's mortifying. And now when I look back at my query letter, I think no wonder they didn't reply because it was actually terrible. <laughs> so, um, I will get into that a little bit more, uh, next time when I'm que querying, I think, but what I ended up doing was putting it in for a prize. Um, and Hawkeye oh, okay. prize was, um, new. It was their first year running it. They're a tiny little publishing house in Queensland. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm just going to put it in and see what happens. And that's what um, started it off. So uh, it actually came runner up in that prize. Um, and uh, the winner um, was able to get their book published. And um, that went to Kaya and she, her book is gorgeous. Um, Welcome to Blackwood. And uh, mine was runner up, but actually when I, I was devastated, but when I spoke to Carolyn later, she said, look, they really loved it and it does need a little bit more editing work, but they would still like to publish it. And oh, so that's fantastic. it was fantastic. And I think for me, it offered out that hope of, okay, if you just keep putting it out there, um, it will find the right person at some stage, or you'll get enough feedback that you can edit it to, to make it work. Um, Alison gave me some great feedback when I was getting to the end of writing it and, and of editing it and getting ready to query it. And she had said, do other writing as well. Don't just focus on your novel, do some other short pieces, keep submitting. She said, because then you won't be so hung up on getting that one big yes, because there'll be lots of little yeses and lots of no's along the way. Um, which I know is what everybody says. People sort of in the writing community relish those rejections and as much as it can be a bit of a kick in the gut sometimes, um, getting the no's means that you're one step closer to that. Yes. And I really feel that. So I've kept that as a part of my strategy of doing lots of short Short, short pieces and short stories and just writing as much as I can, even when I'm waiting to 
hear back a big yes because I think it softens it softens the nose. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so if you're doing a lot of short story writing, also, do you play around with a lot of different genres, or do you find a particular genre that you enjoy when it comes to you know flexing your pen a bit and putting down a short story? Yeah, oh, look, I'd love to be able to write science fiction or something like that, but I'm just not creative enough, honestly. I really sit in that historical fiction um, sort of genre. I do, with my short stories, I, I did an experimental course for experimental fiction not long ago, and I've really enjoyed doing um, some different styles, I guess, of writing, you know, writing a story all in tweets and um, this sort of thing. And that's just been oh, me. Okay. Yeah, it's been me having a bit of a play around with what I can do now. And I think as time goes on and as I'm writing more I'm becoming more confident in that ability to be able to play with words a little bit more I think at first I was so nervous about writing the wrong words that it sort of held me back um, so that's been a really nice part of, of writing more and, and dedicating some more of my time to writing um, than I had originally so it's just that experimentation between it but I do sit heavily in historical fiction I read a lot of historical fiction and and I like writing that I know, I know you mentioned your first manuscript when you were at high school there and uh, and you write short story. I think you should revisit The Skeletons of the Closet because it, ever since you've told me that title and that you, that you mentioned that there was about actual literal skeletons in the closet, <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, you know, the, the, the term is a cliche already by now and everybody knows what it means and it's always used as a symbolic you know aspect to it so it's never it's never really skeletons in the closets it's obviously so that you might be the first person to actually write a story <laughs> called skeletons closets with skeletons in the closet that would be fantastic oh i can only imagine the amount of editing that that story would require <laughs> <laughs> no well maybe you do it as an experimental sci-fi horror yeah well there you go branching out into different genres yeah and then if they say it's not right you can say but that's uh that's an experimental style and it's perfect <laughs> <laughs> uh, and obviously uh, short stories are something that we've chatted quite a bit with other authors and it, it really does sound like you know even while you're working on a, on a, a feature length novel that it, it really does sound as though it's such a wonderful tool to keep yourself fresh keep your imagination fresh and also obviously uh, you know sharpen your writing too so uh, do you find you're doing a lot of the short stories while you work on a big one or do you take a break and then spend a while just on short stories and then go back or yeah i do i i really tend to which is probably why writing the next one is taking so long just to get a first draft down is because i keep getting distracted by these other great competitions and other great themes that come through but i do like um moving literally day by day from one to the other um i find that it helps when i'm stuck for ideas so when i'm plowing through a draft and I think, oh gosh, I just don't know what to write next or where that's going to go by shifting focus and writing something different and writing the short stories, which often I quite like the really short, sharp ones, sort of 1,000 or 2,000 words because I find that you can knock them off a little bit more quickly um, and are much easier to redraft as well. Uh, <laughs> that, that kind of keeps you it keeps my brain fresh. So as much as I'm still writing, it's about a completely different topic. So when I come back to my draft, um, I feel sort of refreshed into, oh, now I know what I'm going to get back into this story and write. So um, for me, I find that works a bit better. I, I find it a bit of a slog doing all of one thing um, all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely, it, it's having spoken obviously to yourself and other authors um, about that, doing that, it's something I'm going to do 100% because it's something I haven't been doing, but uh, I can't wait. I really want to jump back into short stories. And and talking, I started thinking, well, short stories, skeletons in the closet. And then you mentioning that sometimes you're not sure what to write. You could write a short story about yourself as an author. And when you get stumped on a part, you get a special key and open the closet and a skeleton <laughs> hands you a manuscript with the page that you're going to write. And oh, I like the, it. And that the could skeleton be a in your story. closet. Yeah. <laughs> and the skeleton in your closet will be that half your manuscript that becomes a bestseller was written by skeletons in the closet. Oh, I like it. They see that that's that's the next book for you to write. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you've definitely got to do it. Even um, with the short stories though, like I mean at the moment Writers Victoria's got their flash fiction um competition going, which is sort of bounding around Twitter a lot. And that's only a 30 word little competition oh, each wow. day with a stimulus. And that kind of thing is fantastic. I really 
you know, I've got up in the morning, even though it's over Easter holidays and written my 30 words and put it into Twitter and, you know, obviously haven't won anything, but it's the one that keeps the hope alive that you're going to write something brilliant. <laughs> but it's also makes you feel like, oh, you've sort of stimulated that creative writing juices that day. So even little things like that I found have been really interesting. Yeah. And, and that's the other really cool thing about doing short stories. It's a fast way to get you know, snippets of your work out there where readers may discover and want to learn more or find more of your work. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, because you might, it, may, it may be, two, you may be working on a project that might be two, three years, four years, you know, before it's going to be in the position to be able to jump in the hands of readers. But in, during that time, the short stories can be a fantastic way to reach out and get people interested in your style of writing or, or the stories you're telling. And the writing community is online is very supportive. Well, I have found it incredibly supportive on Twitter, particularly and finding that niche of people that, um, you know, are going through the same frustrations that you are and being able to find your people online, especially when you, like I live rurally. So there's um, not a whole lot of writers locally. And so being able to find those people online has been really a great experience and finding people that, you know, are enjoying your writing or enjoy, you're enjoying theirs. It's, it's a great support. Yes, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, it's funny when we were talking about the idea of, you know, circumstances or, or which don't appear as circumstances at, at the time. It might be one event and then that event leads to another event. And obviously by the end of it, you see that someone's trapped by a set of circumstances like the Kelly gang. Mm. But you can flip that too because you wrote a story that you thought you were going to put in the drawer and tell your kids about later. But then one step one event led to another event that led to another event and it came all the way to and now the book's published so that whole little little things come together and form something very big and and when you talk about the writing community on twitter that was something i dipped my toes in uh, started playing around on twitter and uh, for the for those people listening now that aren't aware that's how i ended up having conversations with veronica talking about writing and yes. you know from there I, i'd love to write a book I've always wanted to write a book with another author just to see how that process works. We came up with the idea and, and we started doing that. And, and then of course, concept for the website and one thing leads to another. And here I am talking to <laughs> Nicole Kelly about the Kelly gang on a podcast for, a, for an Australian book loving website. So, it, you know, I think like you said, with that 30 words to spark your imagination in the morning, just every little step forward, every little symbol in the universe, that's a green light keep going chase it, it and keep moving because yep, keep putting one foot in front of the other and working towards what you're passionate about and i know there are those moments when you get really frustrated as a writer and obviously you know i'm a teacher as well and i have two little kids and life is pretty busy and i you know occasionally throw a bit of a tantrum and i throw a book down and i said to my husband not long ago it would just be easier if i just stop trying to write it's ridiculous trying to fit all this in and he looked at me and he said yeah but you can't because it's your passion <laughs> and i thought oh, he's a smart man that's why i married him uh, <laughs> but exactly true you just have to keep plodding along and, and finding the joy in those moments that you can and those relationships that you find whether they're on twitter or face to face or um you know meeting wonderful new people via a podcast that's all exciting stuff i think and you have to enjoy that along the way Definitely. And, and no doubt your husband's a very smart man because I'm guessing he would have very, did ran some very micro calculations at lightning speed and determined <laughs> that your temporary frustration then is much better than the constant frustration that would come if you made that horrible decision of not writing. Exactly Because then right. you'll forever exactly be frustrated right. <laughs> because you're not writing. Gives him his quiet time. <laughs> Now, we've talked a little bit about writing, and but I'm wondering what sort of approach you've taken to the marketing aspects for the book. Yeah, I think that's definitely for me been, um, I've looked at the whole event of publishing a book as being almost an apprenticeship of sorts and writing and publishing and all the editing stage and front covers and all that sort of thing. But for me, marketing has definitely been the hardest. Um, in my day job of being a teacher, I'm quite... Um, I don't know, enthusiastic and exuberant, but I'm actually quite find it quite nerve wracking to talk to people at times, especially when you're talking about your own writing, because it's such a personal thing. And I don't think it matters who you are. There are going to people be people that don't like your books of course, and your writing. So being able to put yourself out there and say, Hey, this is what I wrote and be ready to have it come back and say, look, you know, it was average <laughs> was, was intimidating, but it's actually been a really lovely part of the journey. One meeting people, like I said, meeting Nolene and, um, other Kelly experts along the way has been amazing. And also just to be able to talk to people about 
a book that you wrote. Like it's been incredible. Um, what a, what a privilege to be able to sit there and just talk to people about this thing that you wrote. So I've tried to just, you know, enjoy those moments of when people say to you, oh, I read your book and I really loved it and be able to engage with people. I've tried to take on that feedback really seriously and thank them for that. And also just being able to put myself out there, I guess, a little bit more doing things like signing up to ABL. When I saw it come out, I thought, oh, what a great um, resource for Australian authors to be able to promote their work. So, you know, signing up to things like that and, um, are using Twitter a lot, using Facebook, um, social media to get it out there and not to do so much, oh gee, writer's lifts and getting followers and things, but really trying to establish relationships in the writing community with people and, and know what they're doing um, and, and being able to share what you're doing, I think has been really important, but and also an enjoyable aspect of the marketing, being able to approach people. So having the the idea of saying, well, I'm just going to ask because they can only say no. So being able to put myself out there, um, local papers and news stations and um, that sort of thing that has been really great and approaching bookshops. So particularly our independent booksellers, which um, have been so supportive. It's great because Lament has been stocked in nine different bookstores across Victoria now. That's awesome. And being able to sort of, you know, ring those people and say, hi, how's it going? And how's Lament going? Do you need some more? And um, obviously Carolyn follows up with that and sends them down who's uh, from Hawkeye. But I've found that because they're a small publisher, being able to have that personal connection with your booksellers and with the people that are reading your books has been really important. So, um, yeah, being able to just drop in and look, getting lots of no's along the way from people for one way, one reason or another that they don't want to stock your book, but that's okay too. I've found that, you know, people are very polite and, um, generally people don't tell you to your face if you don't like, they don't like your book. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing. And, and have you ever done any book readings at all or? Um, no. So in COVID we couldn't. And so I have got a number lined up for, I've got one at the end of this month, which is oh, going wow. to be in Horsham at Red Rock Books. Um, and some for next month in Beaufort and, um, Port Ferry and possibly Mansfield. So there's a few coming up, um, now that we're all out of lockdown and looking like touch wood, touch that wood things definitely. are opening up again, that, uh, yeah, getting out there a little bit more throughout the year. That's cool. And I'm just wondering, so the reading at Horsham, will that be your first one? As that in... will be my first one live. Yes. Yes. I've done a few signings and things around at bookshops. So, which was lovely, um, being able to take a stack of books and just kind of hang out in the books, drinking coffee. That must have been an awesome feeling sitting which there signing a book. Which was pretty amazing. Yes. Yes. And being able to sort of spot your book on the shelf and that sort of thing. Um, spotting it in the wild, I keep saying, which is a total thrill. I don't think that that would ever become boring. Um, so being able to do that has been really nice and meet people along the way. But yeah, this will be my first actual talk and, and um, event. Well, I wish you all the very best of luck for that. I, I think you're going to be fine. You, you, you're so full of energy. I think it's, <laughs> it's going to be, the Horsham's not going to know what hit them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I, 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 I'd uh, seen the book in the wild. It's pretty cool. And But I, I still remember I scrolling through Facebook one day and a person I didn't know, oddly enough, but must have known me or I don't know. But it was a photo of my first book uh in the op shop for a dollar and i thought well at least it got out there oh wow <laughs> <laughs> i don't think it matters where you see it though like even when you're randomly scrolling and it pops up for some reason because it's been reviewed and i think oh my goodness or i happen to go into the local library who they're gorgeous in both at the local library and um i was trying to find a book and my little girl was running around saying can i have this book yep 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 so we're filling up the library bag and uh, there it was sitting on the shelf because it had come into the Ballarat library system and it was sitting on the shelf in Beaufort and I just about squealed and took a photo. So, <laughs> Oh, definitely. Holy grail. <laughs> and did you play a part as in, um, were you aware of the process to get it in the library or was that something the publishers took care of? Cause that's a really, um, really important aspect and some, something I'm not too familiar with. Yeah. So how to get I didn't in the libraries. know the, I didn't know the process before publishing. So Carolyn, um, the publisher at Hawkeye, they, um, put it onto the, I can't even remember the website now, but there's a website that the libraries can, um, buy from. And so she organized to put the book onto there, uh, which it means that it just is really accessible for the libraries to get. Mm -hmm. And then I did the sort of the footwork and 
made contact with the libraries about, hi, I'm a local author and did you know that I have this book out and, you know, it would be really great if it stopped in your library and people have been, the librarians have been just lovely about it and um, got copies in. So definitely our local library system, um, but also because it's a Kelly story, different um, Kelly places around Victoria, so the northeast of Victoria, up around Mansfield in that area, Beechworth, Wangaratta, um, their library systems have taken it on as well, which has been really positive. Well, that, uh, you're going to have to get that camera finger ready and, and visit all the <laughs> libraries and, and be spotted in the wild and start a, start a uh, photo collection, photo album. It's something uh, to look back on, exactly. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And, and the, I mean, getting into the library is cool, but, the, but it'll always be a bit of a mystery, which is even cooler, that you just don't know how many people are going to read the book. There might be hundreds and hundreds of people that read your story. And, you know, obviously with a library, it's the library will know, but you won't. But there's that, yes. uh, you know, that, that catch 22 of uh, the cat in the box. I can't remember the name of the experiment. You know, the cat's either alive or dead, but you can't tell you until you open it, uh, the, the <laughs> physics problem. But the same thing with a library book, you know, it, you can let it go to bed knowing that, you know, it could be no reads, but it could be a thousand reads. And that's the magic and, and uh, that's it and that's the magic I think about writing and being a writer isn't it of being able to say gosh I wrote words and people have taken the time to read them and how amazing is that that you know they've enjoyed it or it's made them think and so when I take a step back and actually think about that aspect of being a writer and putting your words down and getting them out there in whatever form that you choose to publish whether it's online or um, ebooks or hard copies or self-published or traditionally published or however it is the fact that you've written words and people are picking them up and reading them like that's pretty amazing absolutely and I don't know I, 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 one day I'd like to dive deep into the discussion because I'm wondering if what we do as writers is actually the oldest profession in the world, paid for or unpaid, because I think wouldn't have stories would have started way back in the day when fire was invented, sitting around telling stories. And yeah, storytelling, the, absolutely. We're storytellers. So I like to think we're carrying on the original and best uh, tradition that uh, human beings ever created. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the art of storytelling, which obviously would have led to you know uh, jotting things down, and then that allowed us to collect information. And just science was born, and they invented the wheel. But I like to think it all came from a story at the start. So, Absolutely, look, know. we'll take credit for it. The writers yeah. will take credit for it, no, nonetheless. <laughs> so we're, we can be, we can officially or unofficially say that we're part of the oldest tribe on the entire planet. <laughs> Story writer, uh, storytellers. <laughs> now, speaking of telling stories and writing, uh, when it comes to your actual writing process, do you have uh, do you have your own little system in place, or do you, do you kind of strike when the iron's hot and and, and when you know the, the conditions are just perfect? Yeah, I think um, probably about eighteen months ago, I started thinking oh, I have to take my writing a bit more seriously. So up until then, I had kind of just potted away on holidays and, and, you know, in between kids and work. Um, but about 18 months ago, I said to my husband, look, I either have to give this a really good shot at doing it or I need to stop it because it's just, it's going nowhere and it's not doing anything. So uh, since then, I've been pretty good about getting daily writing going most days. So, and definitely, you know, a bit more over the holidays and weekends and things as every writer will say, it's incredibly hard to find the time to write. I think definitely making myself sit down and write for those set times is helpful. Um, joining the Twitter group, the 6am writers, which they are just the most wonderful group of people and are up every morning cheering all these other writers on, getting up and just doing half an hour before work. Even though it's only half an hour, you know, I'm managing to churn out that 500 words or whatever, I think I get to the end of the week and go, okay, I wrote 5,000 words more this week than I would have if I hadn't got up and done that. So, Absolutely. You know, it's two that, and a half hour solid writing for the end yeah, of the week. Yeah, exactly. So finding those snippets of time for me is, is crucial at the moment in between juggling life. So, um, and once I sit down, I actually, I've managed to, you know, get myself a little writing desk and uh, a little quiet corner with a window in my house. And so being able to lock the door and just have that half an hour to myself is um, good. Once I get the time to sit down and write, I find that I write, it comes reasonably easily. Um, I think that comes from not having an endless amount of time to do it. Yeah. So it's a short time, but valuable time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any uh, good luck charms on your desk or when it comes to writing? 
No, no good luck charms. But I find the messier it gets, the less I write. So ah, interesting. it's looking quite messy today <laughs> as I'm looking around. So it's got a few books stacked up on it and bits and bobs. So the cleaner it is, the more I sit down and, and just write. Um, otherwise I tend to get distracted. Yeah, I, I think you're right there. My, my desk is looking a little bit messy. And uh, I was actually thinking this morning, I'm going to give it a good scrub down and tidy it up. Uh, and I think maybe it's because for me, like symbolically, a lot of stuff on the desk is like notes and stuff, but they're old now. Yes. So I need to get rid of old stuff because I'm looking to the future. I want to get new ideas. You know, all the old ones can go or, or the old stuff. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. But I've got a little, it was given to me, a little uh, Jack from The Shining and he, with his axe and a typewriter uh, so that sits there. So he always keeps me entertained when I'm sitting there pon thinking for the right word. I look <laughs> over and realize, well, he wrote pages and pages of the same sentence. So I'm doing okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, so obviously, you know, you mentioned that, it was, it was a good six, seven years uh, from the start to the, to the publishing. And it was a huge journey, no doubt about it. But I'm wondering if from embarking on such a literary journey, did you discover anything about yourself that you didn't realize before? Was there, was there elements of your, of your subconscious or anything about yourself that came out that, wouldn't have, that you wouldn't have discovered had you not taken that journey? Um, I think it's definitely made me a more confident person or at least more confident to stand up and say what I need and what I want. So um, I think to be able to write for me, I need to be a bit selfish with my time um, and to be able to put myself forward and say, look, I'm going to have to take some time to be marketing and to be, um, you know, writing and publishing and calling people and that sort of thing has meant that I've been able to stand up and really put myself forward, which I think we don't often do. I don't know, as mothers particularly, I think sometimes we fall back on our swords a bit and say, oh, no, I just don't have time to do that. So that's been a really positive aspect to come out of the writing, which I hadn't expected. Right. Um, and, of course, it helps that, you know, my husband's supportive and my kids are pretty well behaved most of the time. So they're, they're pretty easy to wrangle. So that bit has been interesting. Excellent. And then I guess the, the real big question is, are you working on something now? And what, what's in store for Nicole Kelly in 2020, 2021? Yeah, well, I have started my next, um, the next novel. So um, the first uh, is draft. Is it secret or? No, 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 not secret. It's still in the first draft. Obviously, I haven't finished the first draft yet because I'm still writing lots of short stories in between. Um, I, it's set um, in World War One or part post-World War I. Um, the soldier settlers that came home from World War One and were given a block of land. Um, and it's based vaguely on a a family history moment or a story from my family history. And that was okay. kind of the catalyst for the story, but it's, yeah, it's looking at um, a world war one veteran that comes back and it's kind of looking like it may head down a murder mystery road Ooh. at this stage, which is a bit different for me. So I'm a bit nervous saying that out loud, but it, look, I've done it now. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's out. out it is now but broadcast. It's kind of historical fiction, murder mystery at the minute. And I'm just starting to get my teeth into it. You know, when you suddenly start writing and it feels a bit difficult, but then you suddenly sink your teeth and think, oh yeah, no, I know where this is going. So um, I'm feeling good about that at the moment, but I like to um, kind of potter around and do some short stories as well. And I write for um, the Footy Almanac, which is an online website that um, even though it's called the Footy Almanac, isn't all about footy. It, there's lots of writers and poets and things that get on and publish their work onto there as well. Oh, so really? really? Yeah, yes. I wouldn't have. I would never have guessed by that name. Ah, oh, well, look, if you haven't had a look, the Footy Almanac um, is a website, and you can. There are so many writers, and look, it does have a strong thread of football, cricket, rugby, horse racing related things. If you're oh, I mean, Victoria is the second best football state <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great place to sort of a really supportive writing environment to writing community and another one that i've managed to sort of stumble upon which has been excellent so i write for them and write some pieces there um and where can uh our awesome listeners if they want to jump on and have a look at the footy almanac how, how can they is it just footyalmanac.com or yes i think it's just footyalmanac.com.au perhaps oh. but if you just googled footy almanac it would come up but yeah um, and I'll, I'll look up the link and put it in our show notes definitely so yeah that fabulous really interesting it's a really supportive community lots of book writers in there lots of people releasing books and lots of people just pottering with their writing and, and that's a really lovely space to be as well so when i'm a bit stuck and i just feel like i need to put something out there but i can't find a place for it um i often throw it up onto the footy almanac and it's lovely that having that collective uh writing community oh beautiful beautiful i, I guess uh so you got the footy almanac but 
when it comes to all your short stories, have you thought about putting together an anthology? I haven't put it, no, not really. I sort of, they're a bit eclectic. They're very different. I tend to write for whatever competition is coming up. I've managed to get um, a couple published in different anthologies. So Stringy Bark Story anthologies and uh, there was a Hawkeye anthology called Reset that got published. So I've managed to get a few published in there, but I don't think that I have enough in to be able to find a theme that runs through them at this stage. So I know... Um, like Margaret Hickey had a beautiful short story anthology of rural dreams out and, but hers, you know, they're, they're gorgeous stories. So mine are definitely not of that caliber and not quite so many of them. Well, uh, I'm going to probably shame myself to a big iron ball by saying this, because once I say it, I guess I've got to pull it off, but my, um, my, my goal at the moment, and I'm looking into how I do it, it's going to be a bit tricky, but I'd like to add a feature to the website soon. That will be essentially, uh, you know, Authors just like yourself can upload a short story, um, but I want to create a, a page that's similar to a Netflix Netflix style, so that you can just scroll and boom, open up something and read it straight away, or oh, or right. just download it. Uh, so you can go to your, you know your historical fiction or contemporary. So I want it to set up with the scrolling and uh, so yes, hopefully fingers crossed I can work that out somehow. And by the time this podcast comes out, it may even be up. Uh, or if you're listening <laughs> and out there, and it's, said it. yes, <laughs> so and you it, have to do it exactly. <laughs> so if you're listening to this out there, uh, dear book lovers, and it's not on the website yet, I promise it's coming soon. I'm just trying to work it out. <laughs> it's because uh, it's the same. It's the same. Uh, like what uh, we I was saying before, the boots are on now. There's this huge mountain there, uh, yes. which I love climbing mountains. Don't get me wrong, because uh, if you get to the top, what's the first thing you do? You look for the next mountain to climb. <laughs> So, but I'm at the bottom at the moment, but yeah, so hopefully, and then hopefully we can see a whole heap of Nicole Kelly short stories on there. Oh, what a great place to put them. That would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. So now with the draft that you're doing at the moment, uh, do you have an, do you have an idea when, like, do you have a goal as far as when you'd like it out? No, look, it's because it's still in that first draft. I would like to get my first draft finished, um, sort of before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So, which is quite, I've tried to give myself quite a long timeline with, with the marketing things for Lament and, and bits and bobs going on, finding that writing time is, um, is tricky. So I'm giving myself to the end of the year to get that draft finished. But I think having gone through it before, I have a better idea of being able to send it out straight away to get some feedback on it and get those that ball rolling into the next drafts and editing process. So I feel like um, I'll be much quicker at doing that. So I would look, I would love to say that it would be finished and ready next year, but look, who knows? <laughs> That's a, uh... Uh, it's up to the universe when that'll come out, but it will come out because the important thing at the moment is lament is out and it's, a, you know, it's a great opportunity for readers out there to jump into a little bit of Australian history and then potentially what if the universe changed things just a little bit and yes. uh, took the Kelly story in a whole different directions. And I think there's going to be a lot of people out there. Most people in Australia know Ned Kelly and uh, the idea, and they've probably read a lot about the historical elements, of course, but if you love Ned Kelly or are interested in Ned Kelly and you have or haven't read historical fiction, what an awesome opportunity to take a whole different viewpoint of the, uh, the adventure. And, and of course, you know, now that you've given us a tantalizing glimpse of what the concept is, which way does the uh, Kelly, Kelly gang yes, go what does from happen here? To him yeah. In the end. Exactly. Yeah. The train doesn't derail and the, the, well, the police don't arrive is that that's the case, isn't it? And then yes, from there. Yes. Yeah. So, so no police. And then the bush rangers turn a leaf, I guess <laughs> you'll have to read to find out, which I'm going to do <laughs> at some point. Um, now I've got a quick question for you before I let you go. Uh, so if you had the choice after looking after doing all that research on on bush rangers and ned kelly and you obviously live in a beautiful part of the world just nearby but so i'm wondering if you had the choice of living now or back in 1800s australia which would you choose oh look i would definitely have to say now we have a much cushier life don't we than back then but i would love to be able to just time travel slightly and meet some of the kellys i think that that would be an incredible experience um and not even, not even Ned, I would not, I'd actually be really interested in meeting some of the Kelly women. Uh, so, you know, Kate Kelly and Ellen, his mother, I think to, to know their story would be incredible. Definitely. And I'm just thinking is the, if I get it right, is it Sovereign Hill that's at Ballarat? Is that, it is. Yeah, is that Sovereign still open? Hill's at Ballarat. Yes. 
oh, that would have been fantastic. I would have been taking my laptop there and just quietly sitting in one of the, <laughs> like the bowling parlour if it's still there or because the town. It is. It's yeah. excellent. Yeah, it's still there and all going again after COVID. Oh, I, I definitely want to go back there. I was there years ago when I was a little kid. Uh, so, and for listeners out there that aren't aware of what Sovereign Hill is, and I hope I get this right, it's been a long time, but it's essentially a gold mining town from the 1800s that is it's time capsule. So even the little shops and the bowling alleys and, do they still sell that hard candy in the jars? Oh, they do. They they yes. make it there. They make it on site with the original machines. We were there not long ago, and you know you can actually taste it hot off the candy machine. Oh. It's um, <laughs> incredible, and they show all the gold pouring and gold mining, and it really is. It's eighteen fifties, eighteen fifties Ballarat. There you go, and all that gold that led to uh, wealth, and that led to people wanting wealth, and that's led to but our bush rangers and Ned Kelly. Exactly, exactly. Look, I mean, Ballarat would have been a big draw card for the Kellys, I think. Oh, any, any gold, I think, <laughs> or money. <laughs> <laughs> Because I don't think banks didn't have ATMs back then. It would have been just rooms full of uh, bags of cash and gold, I think. I, I, I don't know. I'm not too sure. How did the banks Safe store their money back then? Safefuls of them. <laughs> ah, yes. Yeah, so that's where you need that old dynamite. <laughs> uh, I'm only going by Western, so I think <laughs> I think you need to get your red pen out and definitely edit some of the things I'm saying as a historian and teacher. No, it sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Nicole Kelly, thank you so much for chatting with me today. And thank you so much for listing your awesome novel, Lament, on our website under historical fiction. And thank you so much for being a part of the Australian Book Lovers podcast. I just hope 2021 continues to give you a hundred reasons to smile. I really wish you all the best with the uh, book readings coming up. Uh, I think everybody's going to love them. I think, you know, the book's only going to do better and better now that, especially with things having lifted in Victoria and now you can get out and, you know, make those relationships, sell the book and become another fantastic Australian successful author. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you for the opportunity, Darren. And thanks for the podcast. What a great idea. Our pleasure. And I'm going to one day very soon actually start resetting my alarm clock. So I may even see you on the 6am riders. Oh, lovely. <laughs> see you then. All right. You take care. Thank you so much, Nicole. So what a fantastic chat you had with Nicole Kelly. That was just brilliant. Yes, um, consider yeah. myself very, very lucky there. That was amazing. Yeah, so history teacher and she's, I like the faction, which is fact and fiction joined together. So, yeah, really good. Yeah, yeah just, and it opens up a whole new world, doesn't it? If you're yeah. into, if you're somebody who writes or reads and uh, you enjoy history, but then you might want to know, you know, I guess like that sliding door things. What what would have happened if yes. instead of X happened? What yes. about if we make Just Y happen choices. instead? Yeah, yeah, amazing. But you know, skeletons in the closet, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, have you got some quotes for us? I do. So technically, I've got well. Te I've wait got a three. I've got uh, two point five. <laughs> All right. You better start then. Okay, well, I'll start with, no, I'll, I'll do my 0.5 in the middle. No, no, right. I'll do my 0.5 at the end. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, well, obviously inspired by uh, just, you know, that, that beautiful chat with Nicole Kelly and, you know, about the, the ideas of, you know, criminals and which criminals we hold to high esteem and which ones we don't. And, you know, is it right to even hold any, you know, the whole conversation which could go on forever so my first quote is from someone called Ayn Rand and that is as follows there's no way to rule innocent men the only power any government has is the power to crack down on criminals well when there aren't enough criminals one makes them one declares so many things to be a crime that it becomes impossible for men to live without breaking laws I thought that was very interesting mm. and very observant, mm. uh, you know, especially considering that it's only for the general public does the rule apply that ignorance is no excuse yeah, uh, or no defense for the law. Well, you know, yeah. that they can write one overnight and you can be guilty of it tomorrow. You didn't even know it existed. Well, yes. You know, so. uh, yeah. And see, it may, makes me think about relationships and how important relationships are and how they can be manipulated for the positive or the negative you know so you know knowing somebody and they can put your name up for a job that 
you know you may not have known about or that it's only just been advertised so you can get in early um, but if you also say well yeah underhand let me pass you a few dollars to get me that job you know it's oh, very tricky all right well, I'm gonna I, give I, you... I think it just raises that uh, <laughs> very quick thing of when, because when we break the rules 90% of the time for most of us unless it's anything major it's a it's an economic hit it's a it's mm. a hand into a wallet now for someone like me if I cop a I don't know four hundred dollar speeding fine thankfully I haven't had one in a long time that's a hit you know I don't mm. want to give away four hundred dollars mm. but if it's a millionaire that's nothing so it should mm. be a percentage mm. of annual income mm. so that it's an equally felt hit and an equally felt Oh, I did something wrong, and it cost me dearly. Yeah, uh, that's so, but that's uh, yeah. yeah. So, no way to rule innocent men. That's why we're, at some point <laughs> we're all guilty as soon as <laughs> I've had many crimes. Well, yeah. I wonder how many crimes we're guilty of when we walk out the door by the time we come home. But yes, yes, yes. All right, so I'm going to flip it on its head a little bit Ooh. and say uh, share one from Coco Chanel, and uh-huh. it is the most courageous act is still. To think for yourself aloud. Well, yes, in an area where you can't be censored. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and I think in some ways that reminded me a little bit of Ned Kelly because of his derelictory letter and his justifications for why he did that. And I think it, credit to him, he thought for himself. He thought that was the best way to do it. You know, I don't know whether he did or not, but yes, interesting. Yeah, and, and obviously it goes without saying to think for yourself is is going to be the very first step in knowing yourself and trusting yourself yep um, and with today's technology yeah you can put it out there loudly and you just you know that's a way of finding people that might share similar you know uh, beliefs or theories or approaches to life you know which can be a wonderful thing especially in a time when so many of us are isolated yeah yeah it's um i think you know uh, coco chanel's quote is good for anybody but yeah it, it does take courage to think for yourself at the moment you know when we're being asked to do things on the advice of experts left right and center um yeah it's still important to go okay here's all the information this is what i think this is the consequences mm. if i choose mm. this this is the consequences if i choose that but yeah make sure that you still think for yourself yeah, but also know you know how any actions you take affect the community around you. Mm. And that'll help you shape your thoughts for yourself. So, yeah. it's, a, it's a tricky game that life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So many, absolutely. Like I said, you got to be you got to back the right horse when it comes to so many decisions, but then also be aware of the the repercussions of the decisions. Yeah. Follow your own, you know. But but ultimately, you you want to hold yourself responsible for anything. Yeah. And by doing that, then you know. Uh, caution comes with every step and which is a good thing because then with caution comes confidence that you're making sure you are taking the right step Mm, mm. in theory I sure Mm. have stumbled quite a bit (laughs) (laughs) okay well I'm going to flip it on its head okay okay because uh, because it's a bit of a you know crimey crimey episode Mm -hmm. and uh, I thought I would do a cryptic quote from Charles Manson Oh, right. Very, yeah. <laughs> I told you I was flipping on the head. Yeah, okay. Okay. So it reads as follows. It seems a shame to have to sneak to get to the truth. To make the truth such a dirty old nasty thing, you've got to sneak to get to the truth. The truth is condemned. The truth is in the gas chamber. The truth has been in your stockyards, your slaughterhouses. The truth has been in your reservations, building your railroads, emptying your garbage. The truth is in your ghettos, in your jails, in your young love, not in your courts or Congress where the old set judgment on the young. What the hell do you know about what? Sorry, what the hell do the old know about the young? They put a picture of old George on the dollar and tell you that he's your father. Worship him. Look at the madness that goes on. You can't prove anything that happened yesterday. Now is the only thing that's real. Every day, every reality is a new reality. Every new reality is a new horizon, a brand new experience of living. Mm. So interesting quote. You wouldn't expect that to come from someone like Charles yeah. Manson, and I'm in no way saying he was any kind of good guy. But uh, you know, look, it was an interesting quote. Mm. And I think, if, if anything, uh, it, it does seem a shame to have to sneak to get to the truth, um, which is something that's getting harder and harder to do. Especially, you know, wow, you know, since I was a kid to growing up now, I think with all the technology in the world, it looks as though our journalists have just become puppets of the political machine we don't 
how do we get to the truth of anything anymore? Oh, just, look, it, yeah, it's just... We've got to sneak our way in. We've got to go through the back yeah. doors. We've got to wait for people to leak information and, <laughs> and have it, you know, it's, it's, it is crazy, but, but it's crazy but true. Crazy but true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do we know what true is and, you know, yeah. what is our own truth? All right, let me give you Flip one more. Flip it back more. again. <laughs> yes, let me give you one more from uh, one of my favourite authors. This is Brene Brown. Uh, who's written some brilliant stuff about um, oh, she's a social um, studies researcher. Uh, I'll get that right in a minute. Give me two seconds. Let me just look her up again because I kind of know all of the things about her. Okay, so this is another one from Brene Brown. She's an American professor, lecturer, author, podcast host, and uh, she has written Daring Greatly, Dare to Lead, Rising Strong, lots of brilliant books about how to not how to overcome adversity so much as how to reach the potential that you deserve to have you know Mm -hmm. all those kind of things and she says i think courage is the ability to tell your story so that kind of brings it back it's like a a little bomb isn't it yeah Yeah. just let let the shockwaves hit and understand what that what's wrapped up in that quote it is it is absolutely the ability to tell your story and it's I think people who write with uh, facts or historical fact and, you know, uh, wind it into fiction and those kind of things, that is incredibly courageous to be able to put that out there. People who write memoirs and biographies, unbelievable. But also those who write fantasy and horror, you know, to tell your story. Because we know that our story is in there, that some of those characters have traits of our own that either we wish we had or we do have and we want to explain. Um, And when people are having conversations, when Ned was writing his Gerildery letter, the ability to tell your story is courageous. Not only the ability to tell your story, but the ability to live your story. I mean, how many listeners out there right now that, you know, the reality is you're walking, whatever you might be doing, but you are every moment you're creating more of your own story it just hasn't been written yet mm. but you are the main character in the story that is your life yeah and uh, so it'd be very interesting thought sort of uh, thought project to think of yourself as a character in a book and how would you be represented if you were to write your own story you know um, how truthful would you be about yeah. the rough edges of, of what it is that makes you you yeah, uh, that, that and, is exactly right. And that's and where I think the what, courage comes. Yeah, how much insight would you have? Uh, would you be prepared to take, you know, feedback? People say, yeah, I think you're overselling it. Oh, I think you're underselling that bit. Yeah, really interesting. But the ability to tell your story takes courage. Yes, okay, give us your last one. All right, this is the point five. Okay. This is, uh, <laughs> I think this puts a nice bow on everything because it's a very simple philosophy, but it's a, <laughs> it's a bit of it's a bit of tongue in cheek. But this is from Al Capone. So he once said, "You can go a long way with a smile. You can go a lot further with a smile and a gun." <laughs> so, which comes us back to the idea of larrikin criminals. And, oh uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, Give us your lunch money, mate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yes, I thought that was a bit of a giggle. But well, I think um, again, flying by the seat of our pants for our because we're coming up to time for our tagline. Mm-hmm. How would we do it as criminals? <gasps> Slow and brooding, as a like mafia style soft. Do we do it aggressive? Do we do it uh, calculating? <laughs> How do you or, say calculate? That's very well, tricky. While yeah. you're thinking about that, I would say that if people enjoyed this episode, please feel free to leave us a review on your favourite podcasting platform. All of that helps other people uh, find our show and uh, share our wit and wisdom that's a bit over the top isn't it wit and wisdom but anyway if you like well, us, you yeah, that also... definitely ne- that doesn't necessarily <laughs> apply to one of your co-hosts that starts with d <laughs> uh, no, i think i think it's uh equal input and you can find us on twitter at australian books you can find us on facebook and instagram at australian book lovers and you can of course look up the fantastic aussie authored books on the website which is australianbooklovers.com please jump on there you can subscribe and get our irregular newsletter or you can just jump on there and browse through the books which is fantastic 
Yes, and very soon we'll be having the short story. So if yep. you haven't visited the website before, jump on, get familiar with how the layout, very simple. We've got so many great titles to have a look at. Now there's no better time than right now, than tomorrow, than in the next hour to you know support our beautifully, you know, so courageous, strong Australian authors that continue to put out material in, in such a strange time in history. And look, you know, by supporting the artists, you're, you're getting a beautiful bundle of imagination for yourself yeah. and the chance to, you know, escape into some wonderful tales, wonderful stories, mm. perhaps read, uh, as you just said, biographies or memoirs of mm. uh, other people's lives and get that inspiration. But uh, no matter what you do, now's the perfect time to support our Australian authors and any Australian artists out there, because I know that you all want our Australian art community to become the best in the world, because I know I do. Yes, absolutely. So we're going to finish with a maybe a, a criminal telling you to yeah read well, books. well i'm thinking like you know <laughs> imagine like two powerful criminals meeting to deal do a okay. deal and then we're setting the terms so there's no negotiation this isn't right. a question right. this is this is what's going to happen so you know at, when there's guns on the table that we've got security tough guys all around so without further ado you got to remember to read more, more. Aussie, Aussie books. books. Got it? Good. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm not cut out to be a criminal. Or am I really a or criminal with a beautiful front called the yes. Australian Book Lovers Podcast? That's right. Yeah. No, I wish. <laughs> How does Darren own that Ferrari? <laughs> yeah. No, thank you so much, everybody, for, uh, well, for, for breaking our 2000 listener barrier yes. and for joining us for another fantastic episode of the podcast, which was made fantastic, of course, by the wonderful Nicole Kelly who joined yes. us for this episode. And if but you want stage, to know more, go and read her book, Lament. Yes, yes, yes. Lament, which you will find under our historical fiction. Definitely have a look. You won't be disappointed. But no, And we've got a little reading now from Nicole, haven't we, so that we, uh, we that do can, indeed. Uh, yeah, get a little sample. Yes, absolutely. So... Never a dull moment on the ABL podcast, <laughs> <laughs> unless we're trying to do some sort of crazy criminal. I don't yeah. think anyone out there was intimidated, yeah, but no, no, I'll uh, I think of some sort of cool effect. Maybe I'll do like a uh, gun cocking chamber thing in the background just to make it even more, you know, more more serious. Uh, I'll work it out with Sinister. the power, the, with the magic of editing. But otherwise, thank you everybody, and I can't wait for you to join us on the next episode. Until then, take care. Bye for now. Hi, please enjoy this short reading of my debut novel, Lament. I'm jolted, one way than the next. My back lays upon something hard with not the slightest give in it, unrelenting against flesh. It's uncomfortable, but I feel no pain. What's pain anyway? No, everything will always be this. What I feel is not enough. It isn't the jolting that's the worst. It's a sound that drones on and on around my head. I can't tell if the constant noise is within or a source outside my own broken mind, coming from somewhere and pulling my mind to something that I can't quite reach out and grasp. Not yet. All I can remember is that I am me. I am Ned. Part 1. The Crash. Saturday. I bang heavily on the door three times and wait. The moon is distant in the dark blanket overhead, signalling the hour, early hours of the morning. The mare stands off to the side, reins dangling beneath her head, waiting patiently with Steve. She's a big bay girl with a sure foot and gentle nature. The perfect companion for tonight. A lucky pick for me that I've borrowed from a property the other side of Wangaratta. I knock again. The door is flimsy and could easily be pushed in, but that isn't the motive. I hear movement within and give two more sturdy bangs on the door. Impatient. I need her to get a move on. There are things to be done. An answering voice muffled within the walls of the inn signals that she's heard and is on her way. About bleeding time, I growl to myself. It's the first time my face has been seen in Glenrowan town in many months. I won't be expected. The door swings open and it takes her a few seconds to size up who's standing in her doorway. Jesus, Ned, you scared the life out of me. I thought it were the coppers again. Annie Jones, how the hell are you? Annie Jones looks relieved, an irony considering who I am and where I stand. The proprietor of the Glenrowan Inn looks the worse for wear since I last laid eyes upon her. 
The death of her daughter the year before shows in every line on her face and the hard set of her mouth. I wouldn't call her a trusted ally. She's tried to keep everyone on side, the coppers included, and it means that she walks a tightrope. She's friendly with the Hart family though and knows my ma and the kids. Right now, I have to take a gamble on even the slimmest of friendships. Let's meet again. When magic happens. Australian Book Lovers acknowledges First Nations peoples and recognises their continuous connection to country, community and to culture. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and honour the sharing of traditional stories passed down through generations. We're committed to a safe and inclusive welcome for authors and readers of all cultures and backgrounds including people of LGBTQIA communities and their families.